we're going to start a new series of videos looking at key comics by issue number, and we have a special guest that we're teaming up with coming up on this episode of Bronzeville Comics. Hey there, comic book community. This is Jim from Bronzeville Comics coming to you with another video. Before we get started, please be aware that recently the text me on Telegram guy has been hitting comments on my channel. If you got a comment, a reply to a comment that you made on one of my videos that says text me on Telegram to get a prize, it's not me. It's a scam. Ignore it. Um, they've hit other big YouTube channels a few months ago, like uh, Comic Tom, Comic Tropes, Mint Hunter. Um, very Gary. It's not real. Uh, let's get into the real stuff. Um, like, comment, subscribe. We're coming up on 3,500 subscribers. Um, we probably won't get there before the new year, but sometime in January, we'll get 3,500. We're going to do a 3,500 subscriber giveaway. I've yet to figure out what that is. Um, also, follow us on the socials Instagram at Bronzeville underscore comics. Um, whatnot also bronzeville underscore comics we do sales every monday night at 10 p.m eastern time and also in the description below is a link to my email if you have any questions and my ebay store you check out what i have there um so what we're going to be doing i'm going to be doing uh the first of an ongoing series with a special guest and we'll bring him on and we'll talk about what we're going to do welcome to joe from 360 comics hey joe hello, hello. happy to be here What's going on? Hey, you know, counting down the last couple of days of the year, trying to stay warm up here in the Northeast and uh, looking forward to what 2023 is going to bring. Yes, it's 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 been a kind of a tumultuous uh, roller coaster ride of in the comic book industry in 2022. Um, the uh, I finally got back some CGC orders from 2021, and uh, the books are worth much less than they were when I sent them out. Yeah, um, prices have, have plummeted, so you can pick up some keys. Um, and uh, we've had all sorts of controversy with acetate covers and creators' wives, and <laughs> I don't know what else. Uh, and it was both of our first full year as you know, doing the social media stuff, doing the Instagram and selling comics and, uh, and, and doing the YouTube channel thing. Both of us started last summer, right around the same time, around the same uh, time yeah. last summer as in 2021. Um, so yeah, first full year of that. It's been awesome. Yeah. So, um, this was actually, the idea came from a video that you did and I'll put a link in the description um and uh, where you focused on one particular issue number that has tons of keys it's 181 yeah and uh Check it we'll out. Do a description of that so what we're going to do uh we're going to do uh, a series and we'll continue it as long as as it's still fun you know we <laughs> uh, just theoretically we go up to 1 million right um or at least a thousand something um we're going to do do numerically issue numbers and each going to pick a key we don't know what the other person picks so in some cases i'm sure we'll pick the same book for our yeah. keys and in some cases vastly different books um so tune in tomorrow uh we're going to do one through ten on my channel today and then we're going to do 11 through 20 on joe's channel tomorrow mm -hmm. and if you guys hate this i promise we'll stop after these two but if you like it <laughs> Let us know in the comments down below, and we'll continue to do 21 through 30, 31 through 40, and so on and so forth. Right. And um, yeah, also, you know, see what, what we might have missed, what your picks would be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, leave comments. Uh, that's uh, how, you know, part of this is, you know, we're just having fun with it. We like to interact with the community, get your thoughts uh, on what you think, um, you know, we, we messed up on. So what we're going to do is, I guess, um, I'll start off and I'll go first for the odds and Joe can go first for the evens. Sounds good. So um, I'm going to start. We're going to start with issue number one and I'm going to start with the granddaddy of them all. The thing that started it all and that's Action Comics number one. The first appearance of Zatara. Um, <laughs> and there are other first appearances in there too. Uh, a but couple, the big one is, is Superman. Right. Hey, listen, Zatara's daughter is much more popular than Superman's daughter. 
I don't think he has, he just has a son, right? Or two. I can't even keep track. Anymore. I'm sure in some continuity somewhere he's got a daughter. Yeah. Like, like in one of those uh, imaginary stories with Lois Lane where the little kids are flying around and Lois doesn't know what to do with them. Yeah, um, the good old late 50s, early 60s. Exactly. The Mort Weissinger era. <laughs> um, so I, I picked Action Comics number one because without Action Comics number one, we don't have anything else. Um, it was the beginning of comic books as we know it. Everybody copied Superman. And at the time, what we now know is DC didn't even know what they had on their hands because it took several more issues for Superman to again appear on the cover. They kind of rotated with other random action things. Atara got a cover uh, a couple of times. Um, and it was just, uh, um, you know, it was the beginning of it. And actually what DC did was they sued other publishers out of existence when they tried to come up with, you know, characters like a Wonder Man or a, I don't know what else they had, you know, other Superman type characters, Terrific Man or something. Um, and uh, they, you know, DC created this character by uh, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, um, who eventually got payment for some of what they, they wrote. But um, Superman is perhaps the most recognizable comic book character there is um and you know tv shows movies radio merchandising the whole thing um from kirk alwyn and the serials up to uh henry cavill um most recently it, he's he's the the father of superheroes that's what it is Sure, absolutely. And, and I, I thought you were going to pick that one. I thought you were going to go in that direction. Um, I did not. I um, I was very torn on this one. And I tried to not let my personal opinion sway me on this first one because I was really lean and heavy towards the first appearance of my favorite character, Nightcrawler, and Giant Size X-Men 1. But I decided to go a different route. And I decided to pick the first appearance of the most iconic popular villain of all time the joker which is batman issue number one and this is a double key at least double double major key and there's a bunch of other you know key significances of this book but it's also the first appearance of catwoman who has been on and off again love interest as well as uh ally villain um anti-hero whatever you want to call her um so you know just two of the most significant comic book characters um as far as villains anti-heroes go uh, of all time i mean the the joker film speaks for itself the most recent one when, when has ever a, a solo villain film sony um <laughs> ever ever done extremely well you know let alone being the first ever r-rated movie to make a billion dollars in the box office like it it wouldn't have happened with any other character other than joker you can go out on any halloween night over the last 20 some years and you're gonna see a joker somewhere you know he's he's just he's the number one bad guy in all of comic books in my opinion yeah and i will i will concede this i, I that batman number one is a better read than action comics number one um, the Superman story is, you know, very um, uh, much in its infancy. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a little creaky. A lot of the backup stories are, you know, exceedingly forgettable. Batman number one is all Batman stories, two Joker stories, a Catwoman story, and a Hugo Strange story um, that uh, are all compelling. And uh, the, you know, the character is already in place, both Batman and Robin. The uh, Joker is really, really creepy. Uh, for yes. a, you know a kids book from 1940 right uh, the you know i had the um reprint of that as a kid the mm. famous first edition and i just read that to shreds ah the big boy yeah that was that was just such a great book um i also had the action comics and you know i'd read the superman story every now and again but the other stories zatara you know kind of had some significance because zatana had become popular by then but really you know the rest of it is forgettable but i think you know, for me, actions, historical significance. And the other thing is, number one is there are a lot of choices. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, it, initially it was hard. And then I was like, oh, wait, OK, I can do Batman. Number one, I can do action. Number one certainly floated my mind. Giant size X-Men one. There, there's 
you know, there's there's so many to do. Um, but I, I, I like where I settled on on Batman. And I think the interesting thing is most characters, uh, both from DC in the Golden Age and Marvel in the Silver Age, did not premiere in their own number ones. Uh, they're sure. only a handful. Mm -hmm. It's Fantastic Four, X-Men, Daredevil. Um, you go back to the Golden Age, you know, Superman, obviously, in action comics. But most of the other characters appeared, and we'll yeah. be covering a lot of them, in, in later issues of anthology titles. And sure. a lot of those Flash. Early... Flash is the only other one that I can think of. At yeah, least Captain America. America in, in oh, the... I was thinking DC, but yeah, Captain America. And you have Marvel Mystery Comics, which was uh, seminal for timely comics. Um mm -hmm. So yeah, the most of the and and yeah, Flash and that was a that's like a, a triple key. You also have Hawkman's first appearance in Flash yeah. number one. So and yeah. Johnny Johnny Thunder, who's a lesser known character, but has remained in the you know DC pantheon for for decades. So mm. number one number one was a, was a difficult one. So um, we'll move on to number two, and you can go first with number two, Joe. All right. So I I think we may have the same one here. Uh, again, I went a villain route here. Um, yeah, you're nodding your head. I think you we might have, no, we don't have the same one. Oh, ah, okay. Given given you know you're a DC guy, and I know you're big into comics at this po point when this this book came out in in 1980. I'm going with the New Teen Titans number two, first appearance of Deathstroke. Deathstroke has like completely transcended comics. Um, you know, as as far as you know, a, a significant villain goes. Think about um, the Teen Titans show from the early 2000s, where they had, you know, a, a that character going by the name of, of, of Slade, his, his first name, um, and then into Teen Titans Go. And, you know, like the, the popularity of this character has has gone on a lot more than most comic book characters from that time period, especially most villains from that time period. Um, it, it that run of Teen Titans, the the revamped, um, you know, Marv Wolfman, George Perez run, it's so iconic. It was, I, I would assume that it was one of DC's, if not their best selling title in in the 80s. Um, pretty sure. you know, yeah, maybe, maybe Batman, maybe, you know, one of the, the big four Batman, Superman, uh, probably not even Superman, probably Batman or Detective might have been close to sales or on par or something, but. Yeah, you know, Teen Titans and X Men. As far as the big publishers, they they ruled the the eighties, and um, it would not have been what it was without having Deathstroke as a character. So I'm I'm going with Teen Titans too. Yeah, I I, I remember picking up that issue when it came out, and I had I was always a Teen Titans fan, and picked up their um, series in the seventies, and it was canceled. and came back briefly in the late seventies, and then I was kind of looking forward to this because I had picked up. DC Comics presents 26, and then I could not find a copy of New Teen Titans number one. I had to spend five dollars for it at a uh, a comic convention uh, several months later to get number one. But I did get number two because um, it was on my pull list from then on. And was that, if I'm remembering correctly, Teen Titans one? It's a thick book, so it's a dollar. Is it a dollar cover price? No, I don't think so. I think that was uh, a regular size. The, the okay. DC Comics presents 26 was thicker because it had the 16 page insert with the preview. Yeah. So, okay. I went a different route and maybe I cheated a little bit on okay. this one, but I selected Wiz Comics number 2, the first appearance of Captain Marvel. Because this was interesting, there was no Wiz Comics number 1. Now, this is not the actual Wiz Comics. This is the much larger um famous first edition treasury, but, you know, I did a video on how you have to be careful of these. Um, if you open it up and look at the indicia, it says, if I can get that in screen, February 1940, volume one, number two. Now, by I think it was like issue six, they corrected it. And like issue six was five again or something. But, um, oh. you know, it, it's also, interestingly, um, introduces some other characters who have remained around like ibis the invincible and spy smasher spy smasher actually makes an appearance in the fablemans which i just saw last night um because he did have a movie serial in the 1940s um okay. as did captain marvel and you're talking about a character who disappeared for a while but has had his own live action tv show animated tv show is going to have a second movie mm -hmm. um and i talked about how 
DC sued most of the other publishers out of existence. They had an ongoing battle for 13 years with Fawcett until um, Fawcett finally gave up and uh, stopped publishing comic books. And eventually the rights reverted to DC and he is who we now know as Shazam. Um, but, uh, you know, he also has a, a whole pantheon of, of characters around him. And uh, it'll be interesting to see if they're able to, um, you know, uh, figure out uh, what to do with him going forward. And he also had a villain that he faced once in the Golden Age and several times in the Bronze Age thereafter. Black Adam uh, is a Shazam villain. He's an offshoot of Shazam. He's basically a, 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 an evil copy of Shazam. Yeah. Um, and we just saw, you know, a big screen adaptation of that character. So um, the other thing is in the 1940s, Captain Marvel outsold everybody. Captain yeah. Marvel Adventures came out twice a month. Um, he was the biggest selling character in comics golden age. And he also, um, because of necessity in England, uh, basically is kind of the uncle of Miracle Man. Who oh, I didn't know that. Captain Marvel. Yeah, I, I've I've been told by people um, I never you know seen this written anywhere, but um, <clears throat> that a lot of the Golden Age print runs were very high because you know there wasn't you know especially pre TV and and stuff like that um, you know they were just selling more copies to more kids and I was hearing that at at its peak um, Captain Marvel was selling uh, somewhere along the lines of like 13, 14, or not selling but getting printed along the lines of 13 to 14 million copies, which blows any modern day print run out of the water. And, and I mean, how many precious few of them survived. And actually I think that yeah. their print runs were probably a lot higher um, because a lot more of them survived, you know, the mid forties to the early fifties, Captain Marvel adventures in whiz comics mm -hmm. um, and some of the Captain Marvel junior and Mary and stuff. Um, they're a little bit more plentiful and easier to find uh, on the back issue market than, yeah. you know, let's say a timely comic or even a DC comic. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, great. Awesome. On to uh, issue number three now. Yes. Issue number three. I'm going to say <laughs> Golden Age DC. And I'm going to go with All Star Comics number three, the first appearance of the Justice Society of America, the first super team in comics. Um, you know, we eventually got the uh, seven soldiers of victory also from DC, the all winner squad. And then you come into the silver age and you get justice league, fantastic Four, X-Men Avengers, teen Titans, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they, this, it was such a unique book. This was another book I had the reprint of, and I read to death, um, because it was, it was funny when they wrote it, it was kind of a, a wink and a nod to like, yeah, we know we're in comic books. Um, but DC at that time, um, really it was two companies. I think it was uh, national publications, which yep. had Superman and Batman and mm -hmm. all American comics, but they um, did their marketing together. So it's interesting when you look at the original issue, there's a lot of cross marketing for their other titles. Um, and the, um, you know, they, they, each of the heroes have their individual stories. They talk about Superman and Batman being too busy to be part of the, the <laughs> team. And then eventually they're like, well, Flash is going to get his own title. So he's going to be too busy and he's going to have to become an honorary member. Same with Green Lantern. And then they, they eventually replace them. So, um, yeah, to me, it's, you know, one of those, uh, watershed moments in comic book history, the first team. Uh, of the Justice Society of America in All Star Comics number three. I could have guessed that one for you. Um, <laughs> I once again went in iconic villain direction, and I, I didn't even notice until I was sitting here thinking about this. Um, I, I didn't notice that I had picked these, uh, you know, consecutive th the first three being all all villains. But um, there's there's two villains I think of pop the head, you know. Uh, really three villains, but two of them, you know, from the early issue numbers for sure um, that pop into my head when I think of Spider-Man. And that is number three, Dr. Octopus is definitely one of them. Um, you know, we got we got him not only in the Tobey Maguire movie, but also returning in the uh, the big crossover with uh, with all three Spider-Men, um, you know, 
he was a major character in the animated series, both uh, all the animated series, uh, Spider-Man, Spider-Man and his amazing friends. And, uh, you know, the Spider-Man animated series from the nineties as well. And yeah, he's, he's come, he's gone. He's had offshoot. He's had like, you know, children of his become, uh, villains as well. Um, he's teamed up with Peter as well. He's just one of those characters that, that does it all and has stood the test of time, you know, starting in 1963 and still being around, uh, what 60 years later. He's a little bit of a ladies man too. A little bit of a, yeah, him and him and aunt may, you know, not Marissa Tomei aunt may either. No. Um, <laughs> the comic book aunt may who looks like she's, you know, 97 years old. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was the, that was actually the other one I had on my list because, mm -hmm. you know, when you do these, it's kind of easy to just say, okay, let's look at the early amazing Spider-Man issues. And because there's so many keys of, of villains that have remained, mm -hmm. uh, I think more so than, than any other book. Um, because even though he didn't premiere in his own book, he did have, you know, issue number ones. And I, I guess that and fantastic four, um, and to, a to an extent to X-Men, but you know, a lot of their villains early on are films like the blob and Unis, um, <laughs> yeah. that, you know, aren't, aren't uh, the most interesting, but, uh, yeah, that was the other book I had, uh, on, on my, on my notes for issue number three. Yeah. Yeah. I, it makes sense. I think it's, uh, it's something that pops into mind and, you know, is certainly, has stood the test of time. And I, 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 that's really what I tried to go with here. Characters that have, have stood the test of time and, and, and stuff like that, or, you know, not all of these are characters though. I do have some that are, you know, iconic covers and, and things like that. So yeah, as uh, you get a little deeper, there's, it gets a little, you know, some, yeah. some are tougher to find than others. Let's move on to number four. What's number your number four. Okay. Um, so number four, this, it's the first appearance of some villains again, but this time some of those villains end up being major heroic characters. Some who, you know, we have seen on the screen over the last 20 years. Uh, this is X-Men number four, the first appearance of the brotherhood of evil mutants. Um, you know, Magneto's squad used with the brotherhood of evil. Right. Yes, definitely different. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know we've got you know the original four um toad who we saw in the x-men movies played by ray park of darth maul fame um we have mastermind who definitely had a significant run during the um the the claremont run and ended up in the animated series as as the the character arcade and stuff um and then um of course scarlet witch and quicksilver who have had just infinite stuff going on with them both in comics and out of comics since then um you know it being revealed that they were magneto's kids at one point and um you know the whole dark wanda thing from the 80s and then you know we get these characters uh two versions of of quicksilver in in the movies over the last 20 years and then uh, a return of one of them. And, uh, you know, obviously Scarlet Witch being such a major character in the MCU um, and, you know, her still being around. So um, th this is kind of seemed like a no brainer. This is a lot of major characters. Um, you know, the first the first like villain team that the X-Men were facing. And, uh, you know, obviously Scarlet Witch being the the star of the show out of these four um you know, it, it just just seemed like an easy pick. And, you know, being a huge X-Men fan myself and having been searching for this book over the last few years, um, hopefully I can finally get it for a decent price. You know, the hype of WandaVision is over. The hype of Multiverse of Madness is over. The comic market's down a lot. Maybe I can finally afford this book. Yeah, I, I went uh, in a different direction. I went with the first appearance of a character who said two live action TV shows and does have a movie coming up, and it's a book that ushered in the Silver Age. And it's the first appearance of the oh. Barry Allen version of The Flash <laughs> in showcase number four. Um, this book, again, it's a watershed moment in comics. Um, and I, talking earlier about the importance of Superman in the history of comic books, uh, really, I think it was Superman that kind of birthed 
the Silver Age because mm. it was the success of the Adventures of Superman TV series in the 50s that led publishers to be like, well, maybe there is something here in superheroes again after all. Um, and obviously Superman was still being published, so they went in the direction of rebooting some of their Golden Age characters, and we got the Barry Allen Flash. And really, in DC Comics, you have the Trinity of Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman, and some of their offshoot characters like, you know, uh, Robin slash Nightwing and Batgirl and Supergirl. And then right after that is Flash. He's in that next tier of characters. Um, he's a household name by now, um, and we very likely you're getting a movie coming out this coming year. Yeah. Fingers um, crossed on that one. Yeah. You know, Ezra Miller doesn't kill anybody um, between now and then. Uh, but um, yeah, this is just a, a landmark issue. And it um, is, I think the consensus pick for the book that started the silver age of comics. Oh yeah, absolutely. At least as far as DC goes, I always say fantastic Four one is Marvel start to the silver right. age, but you know, um, you know, certainly as far as DC goes and, and overall, uh, it's funny, this book didn't even pop into my head for some reason, you know, such a major key, uh, didn't even cross my mind. I might've substituted it out, but I, I have noticed you've done four DC books. Well, Wiz is, is not really DC, yeah. but, um, eventually became DC. Uh, I've got two Marvel, two DC, so I'm spreading the love between the, the major publishers. It, it, it will spread out. Um, and okay. there'll be some other them, some others on the list. Uh, so if we go to number five, I'm going to take a break, and I'm I'm more in your vein. Um, I'm uh, it's a villain book. It's well, a hold on a second. Book. Ready? Are we ready? Let's let's say the title name at the same time on three because I I bet you we have the same one. Ready? One, two, three. Fantastic, Fantastic four. four. Number five, the first appearance of Doctor Doom, who um and again most of the 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 uh, a lot of the major villains for both Marvel and DC talked about Joker and Catwoman Magneto. They were in issue number ones. Um, so this, you know, everybody is waiting for Dr. Doom to be done right on screen. Uh, the first few times haven't gone so well. Um, but, uh, you know, kind of waiting for that casting news of who's going to play Dr. Doom in the, in the movies. Um, and you know, he's, I, I think once they get him done right in the MCU, he's going to be a big component of what they have going forward for quite a while. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously the main adversary of the Fantastic Four time and time again, so many of those Kirby Doom covers uh, later in the Silver Age are iconic and people, collectors really want, you know, Doctor Doom issues. They, they seek them out. And, uh, you know, the Marvel Super Heroes 20 with his... Uh, that famous uh, who did that cover was that um marie severin or no uh larry lieber right oh, okay yeah yeah i think it uh, is yeah so uh you know it's it just again a a an important historical figure in comic book history yeah i i mean i i was pretty sure as i typed this up that we we're gonna agree on this one um and and we we're both gonna pick this one there's there's a lot of issue fives that have major first appearances and 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 things happen, but you know as far as Marvel villains go, Doom is certainly top tier. Um, you know he is when, when I think Fantastic Four, just like how you know we think Batman, Joker, Spider Man, Doctor Octopus, it's Fantastic Four, Doctor Doom, and another character with a ton of depth. You know you know. It, it, is is he all bad? Does, you know, can he help out sometimes? Does he do good things? Um, so yeah, th those characters are the ones that that you know people not only you know grab onto and relate to in some way, but also they're the ones that 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 stand the test of time. Yeah. So um, the only other book that I had listed in my notes was Marvel Spotlight Five, first Ghost Rider. That one went through my mind, but yeah, Doom seemed more important than than Johnny. Yeah. So uh, why don't you give your pick for number six? I had a lot of candidates that uh, I was trying to choose from. I did too. Um, and I picked a pretty interesting one. Um, certainly not one of the most well-known of this list. Pro probably quite possibly the, the least well-known, maybe second least well-known. Uh, this is Batman volume two, which is the new 52 run issue number six. Uh, not only is this a creepy, awesome cover by Greg Capullo, um, it is also the first appearance of um, the Court of Owls, 
and they play such a major role in um this this scott snyder run of batman which in my opinion is the quintessential modern age batman um you know as far as as far as you know reading goes and and storylines and new characters and stuff like that it's all about the new 52 batman i i would i would rather read that over and over and over again than pretty much any other modern batman um you know night falls great you know from the 90s and uh rebirth it, there's definitely some parts of rebirth that i really enjoyed especially like the recent tinian run but um yeah I, I i gotta go with scott snyder and the new 52 run so uh yeah batman number six first court of owls I went in a Marvel villain direction and I went Ooh. with amazing Spider-Man number six, the first appearance of the lizard a character that, you know, had his own uh, role to play in one of the amazing Spider-Man films. And we saw him kind of briefly in uh, no way home. Yeah. Um, it was, there were a lot of different directions I was going and nothing really, you know, jumped out to me It's fantastic Four. it has the first team up the villains with doom and Namor. Mm -hmm. um uh, action comics number six is the first jimmy olsen uh oh, a character okay. who had his own ongoing series for for decades a fantastic four annual is a popular double key with uh annihilus and um franklin richards yep showcase number six the first challenges of the unknown which is um kind of a precursor to the fantastic four um and then silver streak from the golden age is the first golden age daredevil Oh, okay. And uh, Seven Seas, number six, is a famous Matt Baker cover. Um, that cool. uh, is a very popular book among uh, Golden Age good girl art collectors. Mm -hmm. But I settled on The Lizard uh, because I thought that was the, the, the one that had the most relevance um, as a character that uh, has been revisited and is a popular Spider-Man villain. Yeah, and you know, one of those characters that's kind of a Jekyll and Hyde character. You know, as as Doc Connors, he mm -hmm. is helpful and kind and often does, uh, you know, is a, is a supporting character. And then as, as the lizard, he is going crazy. And sometimes as Doc Connors, he goes crazy as well, which is always cool to see. Um, funny you mentioned Matt Baker because a uh, little little not a spoiler, but a tidbit about tomorrow's video. I do have a Matt Baker uh, cover on my um, on my list for tomorrow. So, yeah. Um, we, may, we may have an agreement there. <laughs> really? Okay. All right. All so, right. Let's um, move on to the next book, though. Um, number seven. To seven. I'm going to go with a DC villain, and that is Green Lantern number seven, the first appearance of Sinestro. You talk about characters and their iconic villains. Green Lantern's arch enemy is Sinestro. Mm -hmm. uh, we did see him in the movies. We've seen him in live action on TV. Charlie Callis played him in the challenge of the superheroes, that cheesy, cheesy late seventies uh, pair of TV specials. Um, but uh, he's an iconic character. And uh, I think it's a terrible cover. Um, and there are a lot of green lantern covers that have like invisible characters. It's really weird. Um, you know, like he uses, I don't know. Um, it uses his power ring to either make them visible or invisible. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's like, they kind of you bury the lead there um but uh yeah that was uh, that was my pick i think uh you know you have a classic superhero i said flash is right below the trinity uh and green lantern's right there with him yeah. um so yeah i uh th this one definitely went through my head um I, it you know i i barely chose another book over it um i went with daredevil number seven which is his first appearance in the classic red suit that we know right. that daredevil's been in since then you know uh, other than you know a couple random runs that had him you know back in the the yellow suit or you know the brief time that he was wearing all black um with the you know ninja-esque mask right. thing um you know it's been the red suit ever since it's been the red suit you know through you know the secret wars crossover events and in appearances in in animated things and uh the unfortunate ben affleck movie <laughs> as well as uh you know a, a majority of the the netflix show so um 
what are we going to see for the future of Daredevil? Um, Maybe we'll see him fighting, as he's known in the movies now, Namor. Namor. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, that's on the cover. Great cover, by the way. Um, Not only... Uh, you know, a really cool action shot, but it also really nicely showcases the new suit as he's falling back. Yeah, it's interesting. I think as you know, the comic book character is Namor, right? Yeah, the character is Namor because yeah, the comic book I, I, is not I, of of you know Mesoamerican uh, origin. You what? He's not of like you know the indigenous uh americans people's origin in the comic books no yeah so uh, you know i i i have no issue with him changing the name he's pronounced but uh, then again multiple people did call him namor in the movie yeah like they kind of went back and forth uh you know which is interesting uh, one thing this is we're going on an offshoot here but i'm just gonna say this um george lucas didn't tell anyone how to pronounce anyone's name when the first star Wars movie came out, which is why you hear Han and Han both said. Um, and he said his reason for it was like, I didn't tell anyone because with this vast galaxy that they're in um, there, you know, would be different ways of saying and pronouncing things. So he wanted right. to be authentic with that. So that could be the thing with the, with Marvel as well. But anyway, let's uh, let's move on to number it wasn't, eight. It wasn't until 1977. Uh, up until then, I was calling him the Submariner. Really? It wasn't until Seattle had a baseball team that I realized, <laughs> oh, that should be Mariner. The Mariners, yeah. Yeah, I've heard people say Submariner as well. Um, all right, number eight is me. Uh, do we have the same book for this? Huh? It's it's the second. I've, I've, I've already chosen a book from this title. No, okay. Then no, we don't. Um, iconic run, one of the you know most collected limited series of all time. Uh, this is the quintessential, the most expensive, the most sought after book in this run. Most people do collect the whole run. Uh, amazing origin story of Spider Man's black suit, and uh, I'm talking about Secret Wars number eight. You know, just a a cover that I have framed on on the wall of my house in in two different places. It is a it is a classic issue, but uh, I was talking about the uh, the Trinity of DC Comics. All Star Comics number eight is the first appearance of Wonder Woman. Yeah, um, yeah. She's not on the cover. It's still a pretty cool cover. Sure. Um, because it also uh, brings Starman and Doctor Midnight into mm. the Justice Society um, of America, but uh, they kind of had a preview of Wonder Woman in there prior to Sensation Comics number one. And you know if you're gonna you know be collecting wonder woman you have to have this book it uh you know the first appearance of one of the most iconic characters in comic book history uh have had her own tv show um which was iconic in the 70s two movies appearances in other movies um maybe not anymore but who knows um just you know, one of the super friends uh just has been you know, she's one of the Trinity and was really the first major female superhero. And one of the handful that is original is not like Supergirl or Batgirl or Mary Marvel is not either the right. offshoot of another hero mm-hmm. or in there as the romantic interest or something. Right. Like that. Yeah. She's not a gender bent version of, you know, she's not Spider Woman or Captain Marvel. Or... Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. I mean, Certainly your book is a lot more important and stuff, but man, when I think, and, and I collect black Spider-Man, like the symbiote suit stuff. So, um, you know, this is, this is a book that is, is top of my list. Um, but yeah, certainly, certainly Wonder Woman. She, she's up there. <laughs> Definitely. Um, we got two more. We got two more yeah. left. So with number nine, I went to uh, timely Marvel mystery comics, number nine, which is the first cover team up of namor and the human torch uh classic cover um and really the first time you 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 saw two featured heroes teaming up all those world's finest uh, comics Mm -hmm. up until the mid 50s yeah it was superman and batman were only on the cover they had their own individual stories they they really never teamed up in world's finest they just had all those cheesy you know baseball playing and 
you know, skiing covers. Um, That's a grail of mine. I'm looking for that baseball one always. <laughs> I like the one where like they're trying to save the woman in the river and like Superman is holding on to Batman. It's like you can fly just whatever. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, uh, you know, th that's 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 a good one. Uh, it definitely is. Sorry, sorry about the barking in the background. I don't know if anyone can hear that, but I certainly can. Um, I, I went way, way, way more modern than you here um, and thought about uh, a character that I really like. First appearance of a character and also um, kind of a, a bit of a soft reboot for uh, one of my favorite characters, and that is Daredevil Volume 2, number 9. So that is the Marvel Knights run of Daredevil that started in 1999. And this is uh, the first appearance of Echo. Now, Echo is a character who has now come to the MCU. She appeared in um, Hawkeye. She's also getting her own television show. Uh, we're going to see her and Daredevil interact a bit, which I'm excited about. That being said, it's more than just her first appearance. It's also kind of a soft reboot to, to the Daredevil character. The first eight issues of this run were written by Kevin Smith, who did a great job. Don't get me wrong. Those first nine issues are great. Um, but honestly, the introduction of Echo um, and the, the especially the, the David Mack art that makes some of those the coolest looking comics of that time period um, are what really drew me to you know read this and reread it and when, when i heard they were doing echo for the um you know the mcu i was extremely surprised you know not a very well-known character um but also very excited because i think she's a really cool character and um you know when they announced her i was like okay they're they're gonna put daredevil in there and uh yeah it seems like we got um you know our best daredevil back with charlie cox Sounds good. Um, yeah, I, I, I went, a, you know, I, I tended to go a little more, more classic um, because, you know, a book like that is reasonably easy to find, uh, you know, try finding Marvel mystery. Another comic that I had on the yeah. list was, was four color volume two, number nine, first Carl Barks, Donald Duck work. Oh yeah. Um, Impossible book to find. Yeah. That was kind of another one. And, and uh, we'll go on to number 10. I had a little bit of difficulty with this, um, but uh you you can you can go first. Oh uh, yeah, so I had some difficulty because the book that kept coming to mind has such a bad cover, and I, I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be Avengers Annual Number Ten. It is it is a blocky paneled cover. There's no focal point. You really can't tell what's going on in most of the panels. It um, looks like like Wolverine's giving Iron Man a high five. Yeah, and like and I. Isn't um, Iron Man? Isn't there one like Iron Man's just like this? Yeah, like completely <laughs> stiff. Yeah, and then you know, there's one character that's all shadowed out, and uh, guess who appears in here? And uh, it's it's rough. It's a rough cover, but it is such an iconic book. It's such an important, uh, not only first appearance, but um, you know, significance of 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 Carol Danvers and getting put into the coma. It's and also a creepy, creepy story. Yeah, it's a weird. It's definitely a weird one. Where um, she's like impregnated by her own child. Who that is isn't? Child. That's that. Most of that story is in Avengers two hundred, though. Is it? There, there's, yeah. there, there, there is part of it that's in there. Part, I mean, part Michael of it Golden is in Avengers Art. Annual. Yeah, it, it's such a shame that they didn't let Michael Golden draw the cover. But I think it was one of those. I think they just like would go to Al Milgram when they were close to deadline and like throw something together real quick and you know. Yeah. It, it basically kind of looks like, like stuff he had a, sketched a bunch of like reject panels got thrown on a cover together. But anyway, it's the first appearance of Rogue. Rogue has had a huge role in X-Men ever since. She was uh, not only major in the comics and had her own solo runs and, you know, a relationship with Gambit and, um, you know, a, a close friendship with a, a lot of the other X-Men that she teamed up with. Uh, but she was huge in the animated series. In fact, she was one of my favorite parts of the animated series. And okay, sugar. Yeah. And then the, we got Anna Paquin, which was an interesting interpretation of the character. Mm -hmm. Definitely not my favorite interpretation of the character, but I think um, she played the role very well. Uh, it was more of like a Kitty Pride rogue mashup. Um, which it was cool. I, I liked it. Um, 
but I'm very excited to uh, hopefully see that character come to the MCU uh, sooner rather than later. Okay, I'm going with another character who it, it was popularized in the movies, had three of them, uh, and is going to have another one. I'm going with Tomb of Dracula number 10. Oh, wow. The appearance of Blade, uh, a much better cover. Uh, yes. Iconic uh, Marvel Bronze Age horror book. Um, and, you know, this is uh, also true. It's, uh, it came out in, what, 1973? Um, yeah. And, you know, very early on uh, for African-American characters. Um, by that point, uh, Marvel it was basically him and Luke Cage. Uh, and obviously Black Panther, who's, you know, of African, uh, st- straight African descent. Mm-hmm. Um, there were, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't much <laughs> going on and uh, kind of created this unique character. And really, um, some people believe that uh, Blade rescued Marvel. Uh, by infusing them with some cash for the movies in the late 90s, early 2000s, when they were really uh, in in really poor financial shape. Yeah, um, I I changed my answer to yours. <laughs> <laughs> yours is yours a much better pick. I, I I guess I that one did not come across my mind. Uh, I don't know how I missed that. Being a, a big you know Bronze Age horror fan. Um, and that, that being a book that I've been trying to pick up over the last year, it's it's yeah, been on can, my list. You can pick up Avengers Annual 10 pretty readily. Uh, yeah, I have a couple copies. But... I remember at, at King Con 1, there was a vendor who had like maybe two-thirds of a long box of copies of Avengers Annual 10. Wow. Yeah. So 150-ish. It was copies. crazy. It was just like, I'm looking for, it's all Avengers Annual 10. That's hilarious. No, I'm like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, how much how much can you sell them for when you have like a hundred and something of them? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, we've covered our first 10. Uh, let us know in the comments what you agree with, what you disagree with. What did we miss? Uh, do you have some personal favorites that are on there? Obviously, there's a difference between, you know, silver and golden age keys that are, mm. that are high. Also, uh, many more people have in their collections um, that, uh, you know, is... Uh, our, our books collectors so what we're going to do is um we're going to come back tomorrow um different bat time different bat channel over on joe's channel right there uh 360 comics we'll put a a link in the description um to his channel and uh, we're going to go through 11 through 20 uh which will get a little more interesting because it's some of those are a little difficult to uh to get i know we're going to have at least uh, maybe one or two agreements um in that in that run so um i can think of one yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, some of them are easy some of them are not so much um so uh yeah so join us over there tomorrow and um we'll be signing off now am i supposed to sign off yeah you can sign off first ah yes turn the page wash your hands And until tomorrow, enjoy your comics.